right, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we're joined by author Noe Alvarez, uh, who was recently recognized uh, by the Mass Center for the book as one of Massachusetts must read authors of the year. Uh, Noe is here to discuss his book, uh, Spirit Run, a 6,000 mile marathon through North America's stolen land. Uh, Noe Alvarez, the son of working class Mexican immigrants, fled a life of labor in fruit packing plants to run a four month long indigenous marathon from Canada to Guatemala that pushed him to his limits. Uh, he'll discuss this harrowing journey, uh, overcoming hunger, thirst and fear, as well as the dangers he encountered, including stone throwing motorists and a mountain lion. Uh, Noe will also share his reimagining of North America and his place in it, exploring indigenous and working class humanity in a capitalist society where oil extraction, deforestation, and substance abuse wreck communities. Uh, so Noe holds degrees in philosophy and creative writing from Whitman College and Emerson College. He studied conflict analysis, peacemaking, and conflict resolution at American University and in Northern Ireland. Uh, he received a fellowship at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School, and he researched U.S. drug policy, military aid, and human rights issues in Colombian jungles. Uh, he currently lives now uh, in Boston, where until recently he worked as a security officer at one of the nation's oldest libraries, the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, I'm mispronouncing all my words tonight, Noe, I apologize, but hopefully I got your name right. Uh, so uh, everyone, let's please give a big virtual round of applause to Noe for joining us here this evening. And uh, Noe, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thanks so much. Well, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you so much for being here today and um, in support of Spirit Run and, and, and what, that, what that symbolizes. So just a little bit about myself and the book. Um, Spirit Run. Uh, is a working class narrative about indigenous First Nations and Mexican people who roam from Alaska to Panama in pursuit of peace and dignity. It is, it is about the story, it is about the capacity of ordinary people uh, surviving, it is about running as an act of resistance um, and finding freedom and expelling the pain with our feet. Uh, a little bit about myself, I was born in Raymond, Raymond Carver country uh, in Yakima, Washington, on farmlands enriched by volcanic soils and the hands of farm laborers like my Mexican immigrant parents. I grew up picking apples in the orchards with my father and in fruit packing warehouses with my mother. <clears throat> and I talk about these experiences in my book. Uh, when I got accepted into college, the pressure to save my family overwhelmed me and I quit college um, after working so hard to get there. It was then in 2004 when I was 19 years old uh, that I discovered a run called Peace and Dignity Journeys, a six month long run that indigenous people organize every four years. And it changed my life. The goal of Peace and Dignity Journeys was to visit with indigenous communities, build relationships and engage in ceremonies with them. The goal was to get us to move again, to take action for our lives and to build momentum around running and carrying your community forward. On Peace and Dignity Journeys, we ran with feathered staffs <clears throat> that symbolized the thousands of prayers and stories of indigenous communities we connected with. Feathers that represented specific things people wanted us to carry on the run for them. The death of a loved one, incarcerated youth, drug addiction, drought, decimated landscapes, contaminated waters, many heavy things. There's uh, a main step that starts in Alaska with only three feathers symbolizing all the indigenous nations of North, Central, and South America. As a run progresses, weaving through hundreds of communities, it accumulates feathers. It accumulates stories, prayers, pain, gaining weight over time as it traces through hundreds of communities. We run with these staffs, bearing their weight, learning to work with the staffs and what they represent, to learn how to work with ourselves and with our communities, learning how to properly honor the stories weaved into the staff, honoring the elders, embracing the future, learning to weave others um, and ourselves into the complicated narratives of our landscapes. Peace and Dignity Journeys is about these bundles of stories embodied in the feathered staffs. It is about feeling the weight of your community, which put things in perspective. You feel the weight of the responsibility you have to your people and to your community. 
the staffs, the weight of the feathers are a constant reminder of others and your responsibility to others. A reminder that every step you take is not just yours, but that of others. That the strength you put forth is not just your strength, but given to you through the power of story. This was the healing power of running on peace and dignity journey. It was helping us get back into the practice of being human again. And what kept me going on the peace and dignity journeys was this idea that I could destroy this belief that running was a bad thing. Running from gangs, border agents, our past, danger in general. That I could, with the bottoms of my feet, correct this path that my family led as immigrants. To be the first in my family tree to run because he wanted to, not because he had to. And not because he was running from danger, but because he was running as a way of life. Spirit Run explores the lives of people living on the margins. People who are trapped in the rhythms of suffering like in the factories where my mother still works. Places where bodies are instrumentalized and worn out. People who are saying enough. This is why I run, why we run, to revive uh, and restore um, our story and our kindness to one another. So when, I, when people read Spirit Run, I want them to feel the language inside their bodies. I want them to have visceral experiences of not what it's just like to run through these harsh landscapes, but to feel the repetition of toil suffered by many, many immigrants and the working class, like my mother who has begun to lose sensation in her hands from years of work. I want readers to inhabit this pain, the confusion and the nausea of it all. I am very proud of this book, but it's only a fragment of what it means to be Latino, indigenous, working class, what it means to be a runner. It is a painful read, and there are still chapters that I can't read out loud. But this book is about how running really becomes a healing act when you dedicate it to something greater than yourself. When you run in the name of something or someone, when it becomes an act of remembrance, recalling the traumas, the histories, the hurt, so as not to forget your story or those of your people. When it begins to dislodge you from the painful things that are weighing you down in life. I think running is healing when it becomes a medium for prayer. So thank you all, I really appreciate you. Um, I'd like to maybe, if possible, read a little excerpt of my book just to get you all an idea of, of what it's about and then I can take some questions because I'm really here for you all. Um, I'm interested in any questions that you all may have about what this is and what I'm doing with, with Spirit Run, um, if that's okay with you. Um, so I'll be reading, I guess, um, from my prologue, which I think will give a kind of a snapshot of, of, of what Spirit Run um, is. 2000, two, um, 2003, among the pines of Bella Coola in Canada's British Columbia, Canadian authorities escort a 17-year-old mother in handcuffs to identify and unearth the site where she buried a baby son a few days earlier. The teenage mother's name, Crow of the Sequetma Nation, whose full name translates to water waves, is reflected in her tears. The baby she buried was her firstborn son, pronounced dead at seven weeks old. For 49 days, her baby lived with the power of a name under the protection of Sequetma tradition of caring for one's own, blanketed with the dreams of a mother who sang to him until the very end when he stopped eating. Fearing that the hospital would take him away, Crow wrapped him into his cradle board and escaped with him into the forest. She remembers that night in the mountains as, as very cold. The rain pelleted her as she and two others encircled the boy in a wall of ceremony before digging up a spot in the muddy earth with a shovel. The Sequetma people bury their own. But on this February day, the authorities unearthed the body of the infant Nupika Amak, one who can travel between two worlds, reversing the sacred order by which a Sequetma mother makes peace with the loss of a son. They desecrate the earth in front of her, land that had laid claim to Nupika Amak's spirit, and bring him back to this world to be processed, tagged and issued both a birth and death certificate. Then they take his mother back into custody for questioning. When asked why she didn't register her baby, because she wanted him to be a freedom baby, free from government oppression. In 2004, in a salmon fish hatchery in Shikaloon Village, Alaska, where snow is still thickly packed onto the ground and the air cuts a person's face like obsidian glass, 30-year-old Chula Pepper, 
a traveler from San Diego, California, stares into a mirror of a bathroom with a Swiss army knife in hand. No job, no relationship, no home. She grabs her long hair and cuts like sickle to wheat, long black strands before setting, settling onto the cold floor, nearly bald. She shivers over the few things to her name, a backpack, some clothing, a sleeping bag, rain pants, and a troubled past. Tomorrow, she decides, life will be different. In the small town of Smithers, Canada, 19-year-old Zanya Longwolf, the Gitsan and Takel Nation, quits her job flipping burgers at a McDonald's and relinquishes her role as a caretaker of a household in torment, an incarcerated father, a drug-addicted mother, and a murdered cousin along Canada's Highway of Tears. Against her mother's wishes, she withdraws what little savings she has from an ATM, purchases a backpack and breaks from all she has ever known to join a caravan of indigenous runners. Still farther north, in one of the coldest parts of the Weshraiku, or Arctic Village, Alaska, an elder named Ipana packs her life of 60 years into five oversized suitcases and travels to join the others. Indigenous runners from across the world congregating in Alaska for a race through North America toward Panama. In Fairbanks, Ipana, a leader in the Dene territories, a community aligned with the migration patterns of the porcupine caribou, faces a wind and thinks about those ancient runners who had passed through these lands, migratory protectors of the sun who had moved with the herds of caribou. The time has come for Ipana to find within herself the spirit of those runners, the sun people, to find the courage to leave home and spread an urgent message. The Arctic is dying. Around the same time in Oakland, California, 29-year-old Cheeto awakes to the day on which his dream will come true, a dream of a run that unifies all the people of the world and takes him far away from an area he no longer feels a part of, the Bay Area, to which he was brought over from Mexico when he was only two years old. He has quit his job at EV Games, said goodbye to his nieces and nephews, and scavenged the Bay Area's thrift stores for warm clothing. He packs his backpack, takes farewell photos with family, then washes down a couple of Heinekens at a going away party this afternoon. The next morning, he boards a gray van, which will take him to Alaska. Alone in the Hazlitt Basin in the foothills of the Sierra Mountains in Fresno, California, a man dials into his Apache and Purepecha heritage, beating a drum for guidance. <clears throat> Here besides, beside a fire pit among ponderosa pines in ceremonial sweat, Andrek prepares himself spiritually and mentally to co-lead runners through North America. He meditates for the courage and the clarity to lead indigenous warriors safely across vast land. He sings and stokes the fire, calling on the wisdom of his Apache mother and Vietnam veteran elders who taught him about committing to things that are bigger and greater than oneself. He channels the wisdom of the medicine bag around his neck, Apache, protect, uh, Apache protection, he calls it, and drives a gray van all the way down to Los Angeles to pick up runners before driving far north to Alaska in search of that person that his father wasn't. In Arizona, there's a man whose soul is branded by the tragedy of a copper mine strike of 1983. He, Pacquiao, the main leader of the run, was about 10 years old when he witnessed his hometown of Ajo, Arizona on lockdown, martial law in force, the town besieged by bulldozers, snipers, police, and National Guard. It was an event that displaced many residents, separated families, and converted the place into a near ghost town. For four days and four nights, Pacquiao of Yaqui, Tohono O'odham, and Opata heritage submerges himself in ceremony in an arid region of Southern Arizona. He sweats, fasts, and prepares himself to carry forward the immense weight laid upon him two years prior by the elder Gustavo, his mentor, a prominent labor movement leader, and the founder of the sacred ultra marathons across North and South America held every four years, known as a peace and dignity journey. Pacquiao co-organizes with Andre and Chula Pepper a safe route across North America starting in Alaska. After securing and loading up the vans, Pacquiao leads a caravan north to Shikaloon, Alaska. On the way, he gives lectures and picks up runners. In Sonora, Mexico, two Yoreme Nation brothers, Masat, also called El Que Corriendo Mata, 
or he who runs conquers, and his older brother Greñas take leave of their families and university studies to hitchhike several days north to the U.S. border. They journey to fulfill an obligation to their elders, to surrender to the run and embrace the way of the warrior. Those committed to the protection and pre preservation of the land, animals, and their people's culture. These are only some of the marathoners of Peace and Dignity Journeys 2004. They are ordinary people, proud of their heritage, summoned by a call greater than themselves. And then there's me. So thank you. That was a prologue to Spirit Run. Um, I'm available for, for any questions if you all have them. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Noe. Let me uh, turn my video back on. So folks, uh, if you have any questions or comments for Noe, uh, feel free to start getting them into the chat and into the Q&A, and I'll do my best to, uh, to monitor those. Uh, Noe, you're probably speaking uh, tonight to a predominantly uh, white audience, and I'm curious right off the bat, uh, what can we be doing, um, and this certainly goes beyond your book, but uh, what, what can uh, white folks be doing to um, assist in the, uh, the struggles of uh, Latinx, uh, indigenous and immigrant people? Uh, what, what, what more should we be doing to, to help their cause? No, and, that, and that's a great question. That's a really great question. And I, think, and I think you're doing it. I think keep asking that question. I think as long as we keep asking that question, we'll be led to, 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 to the answers. And I think what Peace and Dignity Journeys is, it's a spirit run. But essentially, it's a listening journey, right? And so what we're doing, there's a reason why this run is happening every four years. It means that the, the work is never done. So we need to create a framework around tackling our obstacles, a framework around and rituals around gathering our community. So we, we got to make it a habit of shaking in with ourselves and asking those, those important questions, right? Um, but the important thing is to listen. And I think this is what we're doing today. And I think um, that's what we're doing on the run. We were the messengers. We were, we were integrating into communities and, and listening to our elders um, and passing down those stories. So I think, um, you know, keep asking those questions, keep um, um, digging away uh, and, and, and discovering those, those, those stories that they get buried. And sometimes in these communities, you know, our stories get buried. Um, and so when our stories get buried, we get displaced. And so, um, and then we get erased. And so, so I think I think that's I think that's the best answer that I think that I can give give you all is um, just um, make it a habit to uh, to listen on a regular basis, right? And, and take in those stories because our narratives, our stories are, are very complicated. They're, they're never black and white, um, and it'll lead you to a very beautiful journey. I think. Now, can you share with us uh, briefly? Um you know, maybe a few stories uh, from folks that you met um, on the uh, Peace and Dignity journey. Um, I know that, right, I, you actually mentioned it in the, in the uh, what you just read, but in the prologue, but I believe right towards the beginning of your book, we meet, um, and I'm pro I, I apologize if I mispronounce her name, but Zayana, Zayana mm -hmm. uh, Lone Wolf. And, and I guess that uh, from what I understand, um, her uh, cousin was killed on the, uh, you know, dis murder disappeared on the Highway of Tears. Can you talk briefly about um, Zayana and uh, maybe inform those listening who may not be aware of uh, what the Highway of Tears is and, um, you know, why it's, uh, why it's so terrible? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, she, uh, uh, she, she was um, one of my, uh, um, best friends on the run who kept me going, you know, I couldn't have told this story without the runners, you know, I'm integrated very much into that story. So that's the part of the work that we do on the run is that we have to carry our community forward together and we are not a singular story, we are a communal story. So I think about the run every day, I think about my runners, I think about Sanya very much, um, powerful female uh, woman warrior which by the way, that year was dedicated to the female energy. So um, a lot of the runners um, that were a part of it were, were women um, who were trying to um, restore uh, a lot of the, 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 the havoc that, were, that happens in these communities. And so in Canada, it's, it's very well known that along the British Columbia, there's, there's a highway um, where a lot of women, indigenous women get disappeared. Um, and, 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 and there's a call to action to investigate. Um, 
a lot of the reasons why these, these women are getting murdered. Women who are coming from very poor communities um, are looking for an out, are getting um, displaced by, by um, just, you know, um, all sorts of things out there. And so there's a fight, you know, they're fighting to, to stay alive. They're fighting to, to, to take back their lands. They're fighting to no, no longer be in fear. But um, yeah, there's just a string of murders that have been happening to indigenous women on the Highway of Tears. They call, that's why they call it the Highway of Tears. So this is one of the main reasons that this run had joined the run. Um, it was a lot of heartbreak in the community for that loss, uh, uh, family loss. And so um, she was just trying to take back, um, uh, you know, um, her story. She wanted to go out there and run in the name of her cousin. Uh, she wanted to not have fear for running down streets that often, you know, depending on what community you were in, you know, tried to run us down, you know, so it was very dangerous in some areas to run in, in Canada, you know, um, communities that didn't want us there to, they didn't want us representing, representing the indigenous um, community. And so, so it was dangerous to run uh, through these communities, but we were, we weren't going to let ourselves, um, we weren't going to give up. And so we were trying to show people that we were out in full force, <clears throat> that we're trying to bring peace and dignity to our communities. We're trying to bring healing and we're trying to show that our other people who feel lost, that they're not alone and that we're out there and we're, and we're trying to connect with them. So, um, so yeah. Great. Um, so uh, I have plenty more questions, but let me uh, go to the audience here because uh, those questions are coming in. Uh, Joan asks, does everyone go to Alaska for the journey or do they join in along the way? Uh, both. Um, and every four years, it, it changes. The run is growing and, 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 and diversifying in so many beautiful ways. Um, when I joined in 2004, before there was phones, <laughs> you know, and we were relying on maps sort of thing for at least, you know, Google, GPS and all that. We were, um, we all, the main run uh, launched from Alaska and it always does. And there's a run that also launches in Tierra del Fuego, Argentina. So they start at the opposite ends and they run and they run. And the whole point is to meet in the uh, Panama Canal for a, a week long ceremony. But obviously people who start in, at the beginning don't always make it to the end. And people plug in along the way, uh, depending on the need of the run. So people join in for a day, join in for a weekend, join in for a week. Um, but the core body of runners that stayed with the whole run uh, averaged about 10. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's diversifying. Now there's West Coast runs, there's, there's East Coast runs, there's Midwest, there's runs in Jamaica, there's runs everywhere. So it really is a community effort. It really depends on just reach out to your local indigenous communities. You know, we're always welcoming people to join. You know, I mean, the run was supposed to happen in 2020, but, you know, things got delayed, um, displaced due to... Um, COVID and all so but I was planning to plug into that in some form but we are very open people keep your eyes open um oftentimes you'll see us on the highway or on the road running with staffs and feathered staffs pull over and ask what are you all doing um can I join you for for a run can I join you know and we more, we're often very welcoming of that um so um there's runs from Canada to to New York um uh, I mean, California to New York. So, so yeah, it's out there. It's, it's, it's growing and it's changing every, every time. Uh, and you sort of just answered Joan's second question, but I'll ask it, um, uh, is the path always the same? And how about this, who chooses the path? Mm. Um, it takes uh, many years to organize the, the main path in coordination with a lot of the nations. And every nation that you run through has a different way of honoring the land, a different way of running through it. There's specific sites ceremony, um, um, that, that need um, um, uh, running through in some form, right? And so there's a way to go into a community and honor it. So sometimes some communities we have to run a little bit more or the path zigzags in, in a way that touches on those sacred sites. Um, and then we have ceremonies. So, but it changes. Um, <clears throat> You know, every day was a different day. Um, we didn't always meet our mileage. We didn't always get to where we were getting. You know, sometimes we did get injured. Um, we had to adjust every day. Um, it was, I think, the first year when I ran that we ran into Mexico, as far as we did into Mexico. And so, you know, the, ch the change of language, not everybody understood the language. Um, we went to indigenous communities that didn't even also speak Spanish that really preserved their, their dialect and their indigenous language down there. And so it was, it was, it was trouble, uh, it was difficult uh, navigating um, some of these things. And so sometimes we had to backtrack. Uh, so you really had to ask yourself, 
why you were running, you know, because if you were there just for the calorie burning, <laughs> uh, you weren't going to last, you know, and so running is, is carrying your story, you know, like I was saying, and so every day you had to dedicate your run to something deeper than, and that carried you through, and so at the end of the day, you were like, wow, I just ran 15 miles, and, and you had, it gives you fire when you do. Excellent. Uh, let me see. Victor has uh, several questions for you. Uh, hi, Noe. I am very interested in the spiritual dimensions, but also in the mechanical aspects. Um, so let's we'll take these one at a time. Uh, what distances were you running each day? And were um, your overnight logistics predetermined? Um, <laughs> it, it was it was messy at times, a lot of the times. Um, the I think the general requirement um, for joining, at least when I did, was a commitment of running a minimum of 10 miles a day, right? But of course, runners, runners get injured, runners drop off. Um, sometimes there's something very powerful going on inside of you that you just want to commit to, to, to more mileage. So that you were surpassing that mileage often. Um, and you did so to help your, your, your runners out. Um, and sometimes you got lost and sometimes you had to backtrack. So, so the mileage changed, obviously, right? And so, um, and sorry, what was the second part of that question? Yeah, uh, overnight logistics. Uh, okay. did, you, did you have, uh, yeah, how, how did that work? Yeah, for the most part we did, but we camped out a lot. Um, camping was our, our most consistent way of, of liable. Um, sure. um, but we, we said from community centers to casinos, like floors. And so, you know, so we just, we, we took whatever was available to us. We weren't, we weren't very, we weren't demanding. Um, communities re, um, welcomed us um, and we were very thankful for that um, into their lands. And um, some of us slept in vans and, you know, we slept outdoors a lot is really what it came down to. Uh, did you run in groups? Yes, yes. So oftentimes we led the run um, depending on how the community wanted to run, um, we allowed the members of the, the, of the nation to, to, to lead the run. And sometimes the whole communities would just come together and we would run in full force. And then slowly we start continuing on our way. Um, sometimes, you know, you were pulled to a certain uh, town. You were, if, if I ran through my, you know, certain familiar towns or we ran through towns of other runners, there was, there was a desire to, um, join that runner, especially if it was a very difficult memories for them, you know, where they, they just needed, needed support. And so we'd run behind them, uh, drums, singing. So we gave them the support to lead the run, but we were behind them. And so we would take, that was, that was extra mileage that we were taking on to be there in support of our, of our, of our teammates who, who we knew needed us. Um, and, and that happened to me too. Um, oftentimes I ran alone, but I think my, my runner friends picked up on uh, on, on my difficult days, and so they were there right behind me, teaching me, modeling how to how to how to how to stay strong. Uh, and then Victor's um, second to last question: uh, Is it in fact a continuous run, or is it broken up over time? Uh, so, like, you could run some distance this week, and then some distance two weeks later, for example. Oh no, it, it definitely varies for sure. You know, like I said, it depends on the mileage that we need to run. The destination that we need to get to uh, um and then you know who's getting injured who's not but like i said the, the minimum commitment was 10 miles you know i generally and it was a voluntary movement at the end of the day no one was forcing people to run you could always pull out um but but a lot of us there um were there for for other reasons really you know we were contending with a lot and we we were trying to find our healing in different ways on the run so um, if you looked at us, we didn't look like runners, you know, but what is, what does a runner look like? You know, for us running is, is so much more deeper than something physical. It's, um, so, so we, we were tapping into the stories of our elders of the community. So they were teaching us how to see the world again in, in, in a, in a, in a spiritual way, right? Like, uh, you know, our, our story is connected to a mountain, it's connected to a river and that's what kept us going. Right. And so that's what gave us the power to, to run in ways that people didn't think we could. Right. So, uh, Victor asks, uh, can you describe the staff that grew as you progressed? Uh, how did you carry it? And was it passed runner to runner over time? Uh, yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, staffs are, are dedicated, are offered and are given, you know, um, by different communities. So there's, there's a lot of them, 
um, that range from South America to North America. So there are very specific staffs that represent a very specific community and a very specific prayer. When they give them out, they say, please think of our community, a uh, community that, that struggles with a lot of drought. There's a drought staff. And so when you pick up that staff one day, you think of that. You generally try to think of that community and that, that, and that mentality. And so you carry that and you think about that. But obviously you think about how you can plug into that story. And so that is, that is a guiding story for you, but you plug into it your way. And then you set that down at the end of the day. Every day you pick up a different staff and they're very different. The Zapatista staff, you know, the Chapas community of Southern Mexico, they, they dedicated the staff. Um, uh, so we can think about the, all the massacre um, members who were, um, you know, in the 90s. So that's something we think about is the children that were massacred down there. So that was a child staff that we carried. Um, but then there was like a leading staff that represented, it was the first one to be picked up and it was the first one to receive the, the feathers and the prayers and the stories that people gifted to the staff. And that led the staff, the rest of us. Um, and if you didn't know, you asked. And so it was a conversation starter. There were a lot of staff said, I didn't know. And I was like, oh, what is this? And you know, you sat down with your elders and you sat down in a traditional way and you spoke about what this means and what it means to carry that staff. And so um, the, the father staff or the leader staff or the mother staff started with three feathers, right? In Alaska, you know, the, the represented the nations, but it accumulates feathers over time and accumulates weight. And so you run with it. You, you literally run with, with your staffs and, and, and it gets heavier and heavier and heavier over time. And so, you know, it, it's just something you have to sort of contend with. And um, it starts to get really intimidating after a while when it's really big this huge and it gets pretty heavy but so you know some you know some days you have the desire to really take on that that energy that take on all those stories and you want to you want to be part of that story and so you ask can i can i carry that today anyone who wants it you take it so you pick it up and then you lead it and you realize oh my you're in front of everybody and you're you're you're, you're going into it's so powerful you know and so um so many just different beautiful ways of integrating your story and yourself visually and spiritually into, into the land and um, everything else um, um, is, is, is easier. All right, let's talk about, let's, let's, let's get negative for a second. So in the description to your book, you mentioned um, motorists throwing rocks. You mentioned a mountain lion. And I know uh, before we started, we were talking about bad weather. Uh, and you having to run through all sorts of different types of weather. So you want to briefly touch on all those three things and uh, how you were able to persevere through it all? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, lots of bad weather for sure. <laughs> um, um, rain, you know, uh, humidity. We were running through Arizona in the hottest, in the hottest, hottest you know, months um, and running in the longest mileage because we were running through the Tohono O'odham Nation, which is a big territory and they had a specific way they wanted us to run their territory um it, it required like i think a minimum of four runners at a time and so that was really going through us um but and i specifically wanted to run as many miles as possible because i was approaching what did, what symbolized my life all, all my life the, the border the, the, all what it means all these things that divide what that means so my parents ran north <laughs> You know, and I'm here running back to the heart of what they left. And so I was, I was just feeling things and I was here and I, I couldn't, you know, and we were running through unmarked graves, you know, like around unmarked graves, we're running through those areas that were just, there was a lot of pain down there. And so everywhere we went, there was, there was things to, to think about, you know, um, how we can plug ourselves into the land and, and to honor and, and, and what we, you know, step on and, and what that means for us. So. But of course, you know, I mean, we were, we were out there visually showing ourselves, right? And not everybody wanted that, you know? And so um, we had to be vigilant about how we were in the community and, and you know, um, the conversations that people would try to have with us. And so it was, it was challenging in some places. Like I said, um, in places in Canada, um, you know, we had to jump away from vehicles that, that try to run us off the road. Um, and, and we had to ask ourselves why we were doing what we were doing, you know, and we, we couldn't let ourselves quit, you know? And I mean, you were allowed to obviously, but a lot of us had a lot more to go. You know, we, we, I, I personally was running to the next story. 
because stories were so healing to sit down with the elders to hear about how they're doing it in life, how they're figuring it out, and how how they're keeping it together, and how they're community. You know, like, of course, all the challenges. But I like I was literally that was my education that I needed. You know, that's why I dropped out of college. It's like I I for at the time books weren't for me. It was connecting with people who were putting in that work. And so I was I wasn't gonna let anything stop me. I was gonna go run to the next story and the next story and the next story and and, and find that as my medicine. Um, yeah, we, you know, there are places like in, in Mexico that, you know, there's political campaigns that were trying to kind of usurp our movement into into that. And so, of course, the community was very vigilant of the political corruption. And so so they were they were questioning on our motives every step of the way. And, and you know, and so, so that was one part. There was animals, people were running, you know, through bear country in Alaska and and you know we're unarmed we're, we're not supposed to bring any weapons or anything and so here we have just in, in you know our staffs and um and, and alone and so we, we really had to ask ourselves you know you know you know ask what our place is on this earth and so um and and find our connection to to the animals around us and and, and see them as our relatives and, and, and go about nature in a kinder way and just um just realizing that there's always something bigger than you out there, right? And so, so how how do you how how do you ground yourself in those things that are that things that matter, you know? And how do you find peace with all the chaos, you know? And so, and I needed to learn that. I needed to put that into practice. And running was a thing that was integrating it all, you know, because we were all messy. We we all had our problems. We're not perfect, but we all decided that the way we were going to come together was around this framework of running, and that was going to be the thing that was going to at least get us going. All right, so let me ask a positive question now. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, what acts of unexpected kindness did you experience? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Just, you know, like going into communities, impoverished communities, people who had very little to eat and just said, here's a plate of food, you know? And things like that, or, you know, kids who barely had sandals on them, who saw us, saw the joy in what we we're doing and stopped what they were doing and jumped on and ran with us, you know, just ran all day with us, as happy as ever. And so just, just those little things, you know, the, um, that just really ground you in. In, 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 in this world is, was very healing to me, you know? And, um, and I write about all those things, you know, I write about those things that the people did for us. And so I try very much in my writing to put that, those acts of kindness out there in, in words, and I try to honor them. You know, when I write about other people, I, you know, I, I lose sleep over doing it right. I, I, I have to recognize that as a writer, there are limitations to what I can capture of the run. And so I want the other runners to, to write this their, their book, right? Because every runner who writes their book is going to have a different experience and a different interpretation. And that's that's the beauty of the run. We are all taking different things from it. And at the end of the day, it's just the people, all the acts of kindness of the people who helped us along the way um, is what made me who I am today. Uh, Marie asks, is this something that you train for like a marathon? How did you prepare for this? How did you train for this physically? Oh, that's a great question. And I have to say, I actually hated running before all any of this. Um, I was a sprinter. I was a runner. I mean, I, I was accustomed to, but like I said, the association with that was bad. It was like, you don't do that unless it's dangerous. Or, but I guess the real answer is, that I guess my life was my training. You know what I mean? It's like you train. I think we all have those life experiences that we can all do this right and so i think it's just being able to tap into that dig in deep inside ourselves and 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 and, and use that as our fuel to to run because like i said if you looked at us we didn't we didn't look like runners right it's like but you you question like how 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 were you running from all the way from alaska and made it all the way to canada it's like you because there's something deeper that that that's keeping us motivated that's keeping us together and i think that's very true and symbolic of, of life right i think we can do so much more carrying in our lives, carrying all those stories that matter, all the positive and all that love, you know, because sometimes, you know, 
I mean, we have we have a lot of strength, but I think we can find a lot more strength in our community and in our individual stories. But for me, my life my life was my preparation. You know, I uh, I was defined and informed by by what my parents experienced in the farm in the orchards. I was defined by the orchards and the apples that I helped pick. I was defined by an impoverished upbringing and the food that I didn't have to eat. And so I was on, I was on steer run my whole life. And here, finally, there was a movement that could bring it all together, that could just that I could like make it beautiful again, and not not have shame in my in my and who who I who I am. It was it was a way to sort of find you know some you know some self love, and and be able to put words to to that self love in ways that we as male uh, Latino whatever we at least the way I grew up we didn't articulate that enough we didn't articulate how our, our struggles or what we're going through we didn't articulate all the loving words that we want to hear as men you know we I, I'd like to hear other men tell you know say other loving things to us and when I joined this run there are men there who were deeply in touch with with their loving spirit and their heart and would say very loving things and, and that was the kind of um uh, model I needed in my life and that's the kind of person that I try to be in my life thanks to, to peace and dignity and goodness. Uh, so curious, um, you know, I realized you were doing this for, you know, your, your spiritual health and not so much your physical health, but I'm curious, um, uh, did, your, did you see some sort of body transformation running uh, all these miles? Uh, did you lose some weight? Uh, and, uh, and then how, um, what, what was your, um, you know, I'm not a runner, so I don't know what the terminology is, uh, but what, what, how, how, quick, how fast did you run per mile? Did you? Oh, did you... <laughs> yeah, those are all questions I, I still don't know. I mean, like, yeah, like I'm, I'm not a professional runner, you know, that's what I'm trying to tell people. Like, um, yeah, my, I think my body definitely changed. I was darker. I was getting sunburned left and right. I, I had to buy a cowboy hat at some point and I was running with a cowboy hat, <laughs> you know, like I was doing whatever I can. I was wrapping my head up in whatever I could to protect myself from the sun um food was limited so especially when you got into mexico so um yeah i i, I see i look at my pictures and i was i was i was bones <laughs> um but you know my, my knees were also you know damaged um but i was i was i was i was uh, it needed to happen the way it needed to happen for me uh, on the run you know and um and i think i think it's a lot more about about that you know i think i think what was more transformed is just just my way of thinking about my life. But um, I wasn't running it fast. I, actually, at first when I was didn't, I was nineteen, I was eager. I was I wanted to tackle all the mileage, and I was I was moving fast. I was taking on a lot more mileage than I, than I needed to um, for for the run. But I was doing it for myself. I was done with run and run, and I was wanting to join this run. And then I saw how beautifully this person was running. He was singing, or they were singing. And I was like, I want to be part of that. And so I want to learn that. And so I do that as tired as I was. I just, I just wanted to see the landscape. I saw, oh, this is a gorgeous mountain. I want to run that. <laughs> There's a gorgeous river. I want to run that. There just wasn't enough energy for me to do all that. And so I just learned how to pace myself. And that's part of the lesson too, is that you'll get there. You know, just, you'll just have to find your rhythm. You just have to find your pace at whatever pace. And it wasn't a race. Peace and Dignity Journeys is not a race. Um, it, it's it's your own expression. It's your way of um, uh, contributing to to this run in your way, and that's exactly how we want. No one told me how to to be. No one told me how to do ceremony. Uh, it was my way, and so but there was a way to come into it. So so yeah, it was very 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 welcoming on the, on that front for sure. Now I think this you had mentioned was pre uh, smartphones. But uh, Tej, I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, but Tej wants to know if you took any uh, videos or photos while you were on your, uh, on your journey. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I did. Um, there's some on my website that I put up on spiritrunbook.com, uh, a few of them. Um, I generally, uh, I'll probably try to put in some more. But yeah, I had this little camera that I took snapshots and then other runners took, you know, and then uh, community members who took photos and then gave it to us and so, um, yeah, so remember, I mean, every time we got lost, the coordinators would pull out a map onto the hood of their cars. And, and then oftentimes we were running, you know, for me, like oftentimes we were running through communities that, that, that were referred to by their indigenous name. So I didn't know where I was until I got to like Vancouver or I got to a big city name, right? Because that was kind of about, that's kind of the process of reclaiming some of these realities and these stories is 
addressing them by the name that they're referred to as. And so, um, and then oftentimes we were running through places that were not uh, not marked on the maps. We were running through old trails or old places that hadn't been, you know, visited in a long time. And so um, it was a little stressful, <laughs> but, you know, we were, we were there with friends and um, we were ready to do the work. Uh, Donna asks, uh, how long did the whole run take you? Um, I ran four months out of the six, um, and it, it kind of varies. So the, the, at least when I joined it, it, it tries to be, it tried to be around six months, which is why we had to try to move at a certain rate and meet certain goals. Communities that are awaiting us have been organized years before. And so, um, you know, um, but it changes. I think now there's, I think it's longer. Um, um, I think there's just different routes you can contribute. You just have to coordinate that with one of the organizers in your community and just ask if there's an ability for you to join, how you can contribute. I'm sure there's a lot of different ways that, that people need help in these communities and you can join for a weekend or a week, um, whatever. And sometimes the vans are full, sometimes we can't, you know, sometimes it's just, we have to turn, turn people away. And uh, earlier in response to one of the questions, you mentioned that there's now runs on the Northeast. Uh, are there any runs that you know of that come through Massachusetts? Do they, do they reach us? Um, reach out to the community. I don't know. I, I remember years ago, um, I just happened to, I was in DC and I was at this rally and here are these runners jump on stage. And then I asked them, what are you all doing? They're running to New York from California. And so I just hopped on and ran three days to, to New York um, with them. And so I was like, <laughs> I'm, you know, I had finals week and I said, forget this, I'm gonna do, I need to do this. And so I didn't know how I was gonna get back. It was my first time going to New York. Um, so just ask around. Um, um, it's just, I think that's, that's, I think that's what we're asking, you know, as a, as a community, um, reach out to, to local nation, indigenous nations, plug into what they're doing and um, ask them about this run and someone's gonna know, someone will know about about these runs and 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 there some are doing it their own way too, right? I mean, there's runs in Utah with the indigenous tribes out there, um, who, who are who are doing what what what's been done for for for, for ages. And so, um, but I think communities have a different way of bringing healing to, to their communities. But yeah, I think um, New York, um, Chicago, they're 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 going they're going through through everywhere. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to combine these next two questions. Uh, Joan asks, what time of the year does, does the race start? So the race that you ran. And Sharon wants to know, where did you, where did you end on your race? Mm. Um, there should be, I believe, a website. I think it changes a lot. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, I believe I have it on my website, too, if you all want to reach out to, to Peace and Dignity Journeys. Um, um, but again, I think I think people are doing it in their own way in, in these communities, and generally it starts around May. At least that's when I did it. Um, and I ended my run in Guatemala, um, and that was that was how how it all came to me. And it was also about learning how to call it quits, learning when enough is enough, and learning that sometimes your journey takes you elsewhere. And, and you have, to, you, have to, you have to jump on that, so, so yeah. Uh, great question from Marie. Uh, could you describe what a day would look like during your run um, uh, on the peace and dignity journey? So what, what, what did a day in the life look like while you were on this uh, four month journey? Yeah, I mean, and I, I describe all this too in the book, but it's just imagine waking up really early, um, you, know, you, know, you know, when the sun is coming up to do ceremony, um, with the community, prepare yourself, you know, you're out camping, weather's probably bad, whatever, hop on vehicles after a quick, whatever thing you can stuff in your mouth, run all day, um, or as long as it needs to get to the community, visit with the community, do ceremony with them, check in, you know, be part of that activity that they have for you, um, and, and till sundown, um, camp out and then repeat that every day. So it, again, it depended on what the nation wanted you to do um, or what, what was needed to, um, to speak um, in their community. So some of these um, activities, you know, oftentimes took all, um, all day, we were out there meeting everybody and we were very excited to do that. 
um, um, potlatch uh, activities, uh, music. Uh, we were, we were, yeah. So it was, it was that, and <laughs> um, it wasn't always showers. So <laughs> jumping into the whatever river you can get, or you know, the rainy when the rains hit in Arizona after not showering after a week. <laughs> you know and being stuck in a van with other remnants who also didn't shower for a week you know so there's there's other types of challenges <laughs> so taking opportunities to like, uh jump in the water when you can and so yeah lots of uh lots of tricky things <laughs> yeah and so no way with with the few minutes we have left uh you you've told us uh why you um you know ran the marathon uh, can you tell us why you read, why you wrote the book? Can you talk a little bit about the process of writing the book and and how and why you decided to do that? It was it was just another act of healing for me, right? Running the the run was one form of healing. Writing about it was another way of healing, and then talking about it was another form. So we had to constantly reengage our story. And for me, I had you know I, I didn't tell very many people about this run for a long time, so it was kind of the longest kept secret. But I think I encourage you all to to find a medium by which to to dislodge yourselves of those stories and that trauma because, and, and to not throw any of that thing, any of that away, because there's a reason why we're putting that stuff down to paper, why we're drawing those things all over. There's a reason why we're, we're, we're doing that, but we need to, I called it kind of a, a process of clearing your throat. And I think we need to clear ourselves of, of, of whatever is swelling up inside of us. And I think we need to do something creative to, to, to find our healing. So for me, I wanted to find healing, but then also, it was, I felt, I felt it an obligation to my people to, to put this story out there. Cause you know, we, we keep this amongst our community and we regard it sometimes and for good reason and vigilant. And so I had to think a lot about putting the story out there, outing my story, my mom, my dad's story. So I didn't want to put people in any safe, unsafe situation, you know, by putting the story out there. But I told myself, no, there, if there's anyone out there and there are a lot of people out there, you know, who can relate to the story, I want, I wanted to see that there's a different way to be in the world, that I went through the struggle that, you know, you don't have to go through the similar struggle or as much. And, you know, here's a way of a different way of, of tackling your life. And so for me, it was a it was a call to action. I think it was an urgent desire of mine to to bring healing, not just to my family, but to others who are going through the struggle. So no way, I, I can't speak to the financial aspect, but I can say that your book has been a huge, uh, critically acclaimed success. Uh, you know, you were just uh, recently named, you know, um, your, your book was one of the top 10 uh, nonfiction books by a Massachusetts author, um, all sorts of awards or nominated for awards, great feature article in the New York Times. Curious if you're planning a second book. Uh, uh, I'm privileged enough uh, to be writing a second one. Yes. And I'm very excited. Um, and, and I do it for what I naturally do is processing things around me. And I think, um, I'm going to continue for as long as I live, um, whether things are published or not, it's important to continue with those rituals of running or creative works, do it for yourself first, you know, slash family slash community, stick with that. And you'll find your voice, you'll find your story. And then when you're ready to share it with the world, put it out there and it'll, it'll, do, it'll do wonderful things for you. Good advice for, for aspiring writers. Uh, so we're coming up on eight o'clock. We're about to hit the one hour mark. I think we will pretty much wrap it here. Uh, no way, do you have any last words uh, for the audience before we uh, wrap up? Uh, no, I, I'm just very thankful um, to be talking with you all. I just want you all to keep at it, you know, have, have faith in yourselves, have, you know, you know, practice self-love, um, find those rituals of, of healing, whatever that means to you. You know, spirit run is not just a physical run, it's a symbolic run, it's whatever that means to you in ways that you can apply into your life. So thank you all for being here today. Please spread that medicine. Please go out there and, and reach your community's goal and, 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 you know, challenge yourself to, to connect with someone in, in a different way. And I think... That's what we need today. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Noe, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, for those who are watching live, uh, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to the recording, a link to a feedback survey, uh, a list of all the libraries who collaborated for tonight's event, and also more information about Noe's book. Uh, also, some upcoming programs from our libraries that you may be interested in. So, Noe, before you log off, make sure you look at the chat. You're getting a bunch of thank yous. Uh, Marie says, thank you so much for your very courageous journey uh, that inspired inspires us to stretch the limits. Uh, Kathleen, Victor, and Susan, and Sharon also say thank you. And I'm sure I speak for the other folks on the call who say thank you as well. So thank you so much, Noe. It was wonderful to get to hear you speak for an hour. And uh, have a great night. Thank you Keep so much. Keep running. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Yeah. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye.